Let's bring in Glenn Hutchins uh, with Silver Lake Partners. It's a private equity. You guys have met before, right? We oh, yeah. have. Okay. Did, now, Harvard Management, when you were there, what was the relationship of you two at Harvard Management Company? He talked and I listened. <laughs> okay, you took notes. Yes. Okay, that's a that's that's a, a good way to start. Just to correct, Glenn was one of my bosses. He, he's <laughs> yeah, on the exactly. board of Harvard sure. Management. That's what I thought. Just like okay. I'm the boss at home, Mom. <laughs> yeah, bring, bring this bring this up here. This is the Alarian framework, folks. Right. When markets collide and it's Mohammed Alarian and we talk IMF and all this other stuff, forget about it. Page 290. This is all that matters. You got things that are urgent, and you got things that are important. Glenn Hutchins, I would suggest that everybody in private equity needs to tattoo this to their brain because everybody brings in all this money and they talk about IRRs that are phenomenal and then about every five or six years the cycle rolls over and the results are terrible and then they do the wrong thing at the worst time. What's Where's private equity right now? Well, you've got to, you're, I think, uh uh, conflating two things, which is what institutional We're good invest at that. what institutional investors in private equity do, as opposed to what the uh, private equity firms themselves do. The great thing about the private equity firms is there's no sense of urgency, which is the capital is locked up for a very long period of time, decade or more. The investments we make are very long-term com in companies and illiquid. Right. So we have the time to build the businesses and create value over very lengthy periods of time. During the crisis, one of the things that happened was the, pri the, the institutional investors in private equity were, were Ulysses tied to the mast. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get out, they couldn't redeem. And that turned out to be a very good thing for them because they would have otherwise done the wrong thing at that moment. Going to cash at the bottom. Going to cash at the bottom right. rather than stay in and now come back out again. And for many institutional investors, uh, private equity has been one of the best asset classes in the last year. Christina Alessi of Bloomberg News once threw a martini at me. And I was saying to her, I said, it's all about internal rate of return and it's lower than you think. What's an appropriate internal rate of return in private equity? Is it double digit? Or when you're, when you're selling to institutions, is it, a new, is it a new normal? Is it a single digit world? You can't really think about return absent of a point of view about risk. Just the two, the two go hand in hand. Right. Uh, and so while uh, there is an additional risk associated with the illiquidity, that comes with private equity. There should, as a result, be some margin over the S&P 500 during the time period in which you right. have a private equity investor. Fair. But some private equity investments are very risky because they involve very risky companies and equity to bond with highly leveraged balance sheets and others are not. Mm -hmm. And so, and different investors have different kinds of strategies. We tend to think much more uh, uh, systematically about risk mm -hmm. return investments right. that are appropriate as opposed to an overall return. Ask a question here. Glenn, you, you have a unique view in terms of what individual companies are doing and seeing. Are they getting more confident? Are they now looking to invest, looking to employ? Yeah, look, I think, Mohammed. overall, though it's very hard to talk overall, but overall they we're in full-fledged recovery. Okay. Uh, revenues are growing, employment is growing, uh, and, and in general, people are thinking more about a kind of investing and building businesses. But it's like a lot of part, we're in a, a two-speed world, as you know. Uh, and the world in which I spend my time, technology, is, is just rocking. Uh, and are you more global today than you were five years ago? Not really, no. I mean, we probably own more businesses who capitalize their equity in foreign currencies mm -hmm. today, but technology has always I, been a global business. I want to look at this elegant chart. It is an elegant chart. Here it, it is. Be Mohammed's. It's, it's information technology, S&P group, big broad blended group, and consumer discretionary. And the question here is guys like you are doing rather well, and as you say, it's rocking. Okay. But is it rocking for the public? Is tech investing worth it for the public? Are all the gains made in the private equity space, you go public, and, you know, two, three, four years out, too many of these investments. I looked at eBay. eBay, big pop on the IPO. It's a 4% annual return on eBay going back 10, 12 years. What, it, it's, is the public getting their fair share of tech, or is it all made by the proverbial Silicon Valley? It's a good question. Well, the, um, the, there is a lot of money made by people who make successful investments at the early stage Fair. of companies that turn out to be like eBay. Those are, those are investments with breathtaking risk uh, and very high mortality rates, which are not for the public investor. Those are typically done by institutional mm -hmm. investors and in, in some of the best venture capital funds. So give that's the, not, give, you can't compare that to what happens in the public markets for these stocks. Give us a sense of the mortality rate. Is it uh, one in 10, is the it typical, one in five? The, uh, you know, I'm not a venture capital investor, but sort of I understand in just years of observation that it's about uh, eight out of 10. 
So if you're if you are, it's like a baseball game. If you sure. bat 200 to 220, you got a good career. If you bat 300 to 350, you are a world class uh, venture capital investor. Look, I have to ask, right. I have to be fair and ask about Facebook because that's what everyone was, was talking about. Does Pimco wish they were in Facebook? Of course, I think anybody wishes they were in Facebook oh, early on. No, but you're in Facebook. Don't you have a Facebook page? I mean, I even now ha have a Facebook page. I mean, I, I That's a great exclusive. Uh, Mohammed El Arian has Facebook a Facebook page. page. No question. <laughs> anybody won't friend me. Do you have a Facebook page, sir? <laughs> I do not. Okay, you do not. That's, that's news in itself. There's a right, Bloomberg no. headline going out right ask, now. Ask me why no. do I have a Facebook why page? Why do you have a Facebook page? Because when the Middle East started happening, I realized how important social media is yeah, in transmitting right. a tremendous amount of information. Like Farid Zakaria says, from many to many. Right. right? And it's, it's incredibly, it's the only way I had of hearing what people on the ground were facing. What about the silliness of this? Uh, Barry Riddle said that wonderful chart from the New York Times of those of 1999. It's more, it's a new concentrated enthusiasm cloud computing and all that. Your thoughts again on the valuation of Facebook? Well, say Facebook, Facebook's not a cloud computing uh, investment. I understand that. Facebook's right. a social networking right. investment. Right. Uh, look, the, 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 uh, the valuations for some of these companies are, uh, many commentators believe they're stratospheric. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the valuations that companies like Google had, even Microsoft when it was a rapidly growing and emerging company, and Apple, et cetera, mm -hmm. they were also quote unquote stratospheric, but people who were long term buy and hold investors in what became some of the most important technology companies in the world made money. Yeah. Right? So uh, if you invest in a winner, uh, and are a buy and hold investor as opposed to right. churning, uh, you'll make money, okay. I believe. Here's a great business plan. I was talking to Mario Gabelli about this today. Bring it up, please. It's IBM, folks. Uh, what a chart. What a terrific number of years for IBM. As an institutional investor, you want to find the IBMs when they're, you know, 60, 70 bucks a share there. How do you determine bigger companies having ch regime changes in management? We look at are there any disruptive technologies that management can keep up with or not? That's a really key issue that our credit analysts spend a tremendous amount of time at. We look at the ability to respond, right? Do they have positive cash flow? Do they have the right balance sheet? Have they turned out their debt? So it's ultimately willingness and ability. And what we look for are companies that have both. Right. But I think there's another point here, which is that there, people, can, uh, again, conflate things. Uh, the, the IBMs of the world, the Hewlett Packards of the world, Cisco's, et cetera, have become large, mature companies. Mm -hmm. They're not going to grow at the same rates that uh, companies like Facebook will. Uh, they have, but they have become really great businesses that, com that are uh, terrific places for people to put their money because they've got underlying growth right. characteristics versus some of the other businesses that were great business in the past but now don't have the growth driver. Uh, here's the new economist for PIMCO. You can bring it up right over here. They hired him, John Maynard Keynes. Oh, no, wait, no, no, that was a few years ago. This is from Hilarion's book. The difficulty lies not in the new ideas but in escaping from the old ones which ramify for those brought up as most of us has been into every corner of our minds. What a wonderful quote. Bring that over to investing. I mean, new normals, more economics, I'm going to suggest. From where you sit in your combine, what's going to be the new model for investment? Well, the key thing, Tom, is we're already seeing changes. So imagine what you said about Ireland. Imagine what you just heard about, about Portugal. Everything is changing right now. So in Europe, for example, it was unthinkable that Eurozone economies could possibly restructure. Mm -hmm. They were, quote, interest rate risk. Today, people realize that they are credit risk. They are default risk. And we are seeing these amazing national and global realignments that are putting in play conventional wisdom. And the hardest thing to do is to question conventional wisdom. Uh, let's bring up chart two over here. This is a fabulous chart, folks. Thanks to Alan Kruger for a terrific op-ed this week. That's not chart two, that's, that's the Portugal one. I want to get chart two up. There it is, right there. Man. Alan Kruger, a disturbing problem. Glenn, you look at this, yep. employment to population ratio. You were on the Clinton transition team. You're one, when Nancy Pelosi talks about Wall Street, you're it. People like you are it. How do you assume a government policy to turn around that employment? To population ratio. Well, two corrections. One, I was in the Clinton White House. Excuse in addition me. to transition, but that, okay. uh, but the, uh, and I'm not Wall Street. I've never, I've never worked at a broker dealer and never been a banker. I'm an investor. But the public but, perceives private equity as Wall Street. Wouldn't you agree with that? 
I don't think the public has a, a view of private equity. I think the public has a view of kind of Wall Street and, pe and people okay. who are closer to it, like you and me. What's a policy uh, we need to do to jumpstart this I think this is a really, economy. really important issue. This is the key issue that we have. Uh, I think I wish people like Mohammed would turn their minds to these issues because we need a sort of a, a theory, a labor-based theory of how we build our economy and how we build our businesses. So I think there are two things we can do. Uh, very broad strokes, but this is the key issue for us, our country. One is we, we ought to, I think, substantially reduce the cost of labor in the United States. Uh, which, when you hire someone in the United States, you add 30 to 40 percent to their salary in order to, to calculate total cost. To benefit cost. up and all that. Yeah. When you, when you, uh, you don't do that when you hire someone outside the United States uh, in Asia. Um, th that's because we fund our social safety net by what is essentially taxes on employment. What I would personally do is take all those taxes off on employment and fund that with a national sales tax. You would automatically reduce the uh, cost of labor in the United States by 30 to 40 percent, and you'd force people who are Im exporting goods into the United States to subsidize our social safety net rather than free ride on it today. So it's a fat tax to be taken over to give us that cheap labor. Is there, to, is to there a model that shows that that's worked out there? It's more than that. I mean, I often like to agree with, with Glenn here. I'm going I'm to somewhat disagree. <laughs> um, first, thank you, Tom, for showing that chart because yeah. it shows you how partial the unemployment okay. number is. The real question is how many people are working supporting the rest okay, of society. That's precisely right. We're, we're going to have to come back. I'm sorry for that. Glenn Hutchins, thank you so much.